Hey, wet back. Dirty Mexican. Go back where you came You're from. You're wasting my time. Forget going to college. Grease ball. Speak English, Beaner. Today, we hear more and more talk like that, as Mexicans are blamed for an economic crisis they never created. Politicians say they must stop what they call the immigrant hordes from crossing the border. And they don't care if it costs children their health, their education, their hope for a life. Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, many of us prefer the terms Chicana and Chicano, are not the only people who face these problems. They are one of many peoples in the United States called Latino and Latina, or as some say, Hispanic. Today, there are people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the many countries of South America. According to the official census, there were 25 million Latinos here in 1993, and we know that in reality the number is much higher. The number grew by almost 70% during the 1980s, and California is now at least 25% Latino. It's time to say, listen to our side of the story. All Latino people have a rich history and culture, but where do you learn about them? Are we on TV? If you can find any Latinos or Latinas there, you will find that they are usually gangsters or drug dealers. At best, Latinos are shown to be lazy, foolish, or just plain dumb. Hollywood movies have stereotyped Latinos for years as knife-wielding criminals and steamy senoritas, or just dismiss them as irrelevant nobodies. Are we role models in school or heroes in history classes? No way. We almost never learn about our history, our heroes and heroines. All Latinas and Latinos share a history of colonization, of being invaded and violently dominated by foreigners. That story begins with the fatal arrival of Columbus in the lands we call Las Americas. We are taught that Columbus discovered this continent. But hey, how can you discover a place where 90 million human beings already live? The invaders did not see the native or indigenous people of the Americas as human beings. Within a hundred years, they had caused the death of 80 million Indians. They did this with guns, horses, starvation, and diseases that they brought from Europe. In what we now call Latin America, the foreigners were the Spaniards or the Portuguese. Out of their invasions came a new people, formed from the mixture of native or indigenous women, European men and Africans brought to the Americas as slaves. This new breed was often called mestizo, meaning mixed. Perhaps the best name is what we often call ourselves, la raza, the people. Raza are mostly of indigenous origin. Scholars think that 20 million Indians lived in what is now Mexico, that about 300,000 Spaniards went there and 250,000 Africans. Over the centuries, the indigenous influence has been strongest in Mexico and Central America. You can see that in the way Raza live, eat, celebrate, and often how we look. Of all Latinos, it is Los Mexicanos who have the longest history in what's now called the United States. Almost a third of the United States used to be part of Mexico. Before that, of course, it was the land of native tribes, pueblos, and nations. Today, the Southwest still has many places with Spanish names, like Los Angeles, San Antonio, San Luis, Albuquerque. And just think about people's favorite foods, burritos and tacos, or the names of cars. You can buy a Fiesta or an El Dorado. And music, Tribanda or Tex-Mex, and what about Santana? Mexicano culture is everywhere. It's only the Mexican and Chicano people who are kept invisible. That's the story we want to tell here, the story of people we call Chicanas and Chicanos. Let us tell our side of the story from the beginning. roots go back to ancient Mexico and what is now Central America before the arrival of people from Europe. 
our roots go back to the mysteries of ancient civilizations long hidden in the jungle. Like the Olmeca with their great stone heads. Like the Chichimeca, Tolteca, Mixteca, Azteca, Yaqui. Like the Maya in the Yucatan, Chiapas, Guatemala. All those faces from the past that haunt us. The gods like Quetzalcoatl, the great cities like Tenochtitlan, or the Indian societies of what is now the Southwest, like the Anasazi and the Pueblos. Those cultures were often far ahead of European civilization in art and architecture, mathematics, medicine, agriculture, astronomy, housing, libraries, and calendar making. They were not perfect societies, and some, like the late Aztecs, had very privileged upper classes. But these societies weren't organized according to the idea that each person had to fight for survival in a chaotic, dog-eat-dog -dog society. That indigenous world was smashed when Spaniards arrived in 1519. At the time, European countries like England and Holland had begun to grow rich from trading with people in Asia and Africa. They were finding new sources of wealth a whole new economic system was emerging in Europe called capitalism. Columbus's so-called discovery of America gave Spain a chance to compete with those other countries. Above all, Spain wanted gold. When the Spaniards came, the Aztecs, led by Cuauhtémoc, fought back bravely, but they could not defeat the gold-hungry invaders. Aztec leaders were burned alive or hanged. To the invaders, such cruelty and exploitation seemed perfectly normal and even justifiable. Sad to say, the Catholic Church supported the invaders, although a few priests tried to help the Indians. Indigenous people were worked like slaves in the mines and workshops set up by the Spanish rulers. The native women were raped. It was a time of death and destruction, tears and terror. Still looking for gold, Spain sent more invaders to what is now the southwest of the United States. In New Mexico, Pueblo people supported by mestizos rose up in the Great Rebellion of 1680. They drove the Spaniards out for 12 years. During the 1700s, the church set up missions in California, huge plantations that depended totally on enslaved Indian labor. In Arizona and Texas, the Spaniards met fierce resistance from the Apaches and other tribes. Then, in 1821, Mexico won its independence from Spain. Father Hidalgo launched Mexico's rebellion on September 16th, now celebrated as Mexican Independence Day. The troops in that war were mostly Indian. A favorite symbol of the struggle was the Virgen de Guadalupe, the dark-skinned Virgin Mary. La Raza could relate to her and her image continues to be found in many of today's struggles. All those lands and what we call the Southwest today were now under the rule of Mexico, not Spain. But a new master would soon dominate. In the newborn United States, men dreamed of expanding their country all the way to the Pacific Ocean to build trade with Asia and gain great wealth. This meant taking over Mexico. In the 1800s, an idea was invented to justify that greed. They called it manifest destiny, meaning that the United States was destined to dominate everyone in its way because of its obvious superiority. As one of the leaders, Sam Houston, said, the Mexicans are no better than the Indians. I see no reason why we should not take their land. All these men believed in white supremacy, and some of them wanted more states with slavery. They concocted a secret plan for grabbing Mexican territory. Their first movida was against Texas, then part of Mexico. Led by President Andrew Jackson, they encouraged lots of Euro-Americans, white people, or Anglos, to settle in Texas. When enough had come, 
the settlers declared their independence from Mexico. Mexico sent troops to defend its territory, and the famous Battle of the Alamo took place at San Antonio in 1836. Most U.S. history books tell you that Mexico carried out a massacre of brave white men defending the Alamo Fort, but the truth is it was a long, hard battle in which many Mexicans died. The Anglos in the Alamo were actually led by an escaped murderer, a fortune hunter, and a millionaire land dealer who may have fought for the Alamo because he had heard reports of treasure buried under it. In the next battle, the United States defeated Mexico and took over Texas. Later, it was made part of this country, the new state of Texas. But the Yankees wanted even more. When Mexico refused to sell its land, President James Polk cooked up a pretext to invade. He sent troops into an area on the border that had been claimed by Mexico. When the Mexicans fought back, Polk cried, War! We've been invaded! But it was just an excuse. In his diary, Polk wrote that what he really wanted was to get Mexican land. In 1847, Polk's troops marched to Mexico City, killing many civilians on the way. The invasion was so brutal that some U.S. soldiers of Irish Catholic origin deserted the army and formed a battalion to help the Mexicanos. But Mexico, a weak new country, couldn't stop the Yankee march to the halls of Montezuma, as the Marine hymn says. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. The War of 1846-48 to 48 ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That treaty gave the United States half of Mexico, which became the states of California, New Mexico, Nevada, large parts of Colorado, Arizona, and Utah, plus pieces of Wyoming, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Mexico had been bigger than the United States before the war. Now the United States was a giant, and Mexico much smaller. In the treaty, the Yankees promised that any Mexicans who stayed would have all the rights of U.S. citizens. Their property, liberty, and religion would be respected. But those promises were broken overnight. The new rulers grabbed almost all land held by Mexicans, millions of acres, by trickery and violence. They also took over our skills, like those of the cowboy or vaquero. You can tell this from the Spanish words still used in cattle raising, like lasso, corral, rodeo. The Anglo invaders also adopted our transportation systems, like the mule train, and our architecture, like building with adobes. In fact, they would have had trouble surviving without raza and Indian know-how. Courageous Mexicans resisted the U.S. takeover with their lives. They included Tiburcio Vasquez in California, who robbed Anglo cattle owners and stagecoaches with wide support from the people until he was caught and hanged in 1875. Joaquin Murrieta fought back after being driven out of his mining claim by white miners. <laughs> Texas had guerrilla fighters like Gregorio Cortez, who was persecuted because of a deputy's mistake and finally captured. In New Mexico, El Fego Baca once held off 80 white men shooting at him for 36 hours. The Anglos called these fighters bandits, but to poor Mexicanos, they were heroes. In occupied America, as it has been called, 
ordinary people also resisted with secret organizations like Las Gorras Blancas, with Spanish language newspapers, and with cultural traditions that gave them unity. The invaders used force everywhere to crush any kind of resistance by women as well as men. A Mexican woman named Josefa, sometimes called Juanita, was lynched at Downeyville, California in 1851 by Anglo gold miners. Lynching Mexicans was common. It happened for most of the same reasons as the lynching of black people in the South, to keep the oppressed under control. The lynchings were a kind of terrorism to prevent people from rebelling. All through those years, the U.S. government treated Mexicans like a colonized people, without respect. We were made strangers in our own land. Mexican language, food, architecture, and music were still there, but the sign said things like, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Back in Mexico itself, the people fought hard against a new invader, France. Napoleon III wanted to make Mexico a colony and sent troops. Mexicanos defeated the French on May 5th, 1862 at Puebla, our Cinco de Mayo. Later, the French were able to impose Emperor Maximilian and Empress Carlota for a few years. Finally, under the leadership of President Benito Juarez, a Zapotec Indian, Mexico drove them out. But a new invader was waiting in the wings. This one came with dollars. Encouraged by President Porfirio Diaz, U.S. investors took control of Mexico's economy, its railroads, industries, much wealth. At the same time, Mexican landlords were driving peasants off the land and capitalist bosses were squeezing workers. The poor got poorer and the rich got richer. Something had to change. <laughs> Despite terrible oppression, many peasants fought back against the landlords. Workers rose up in big strikes, like the miners at Cananea near the Arizona border in 1906, and the textile workers at the Rio Blanco plant, led by Lucrecia Torres, one of many strong, brave women leaders of the workers. Massacres and other bloody repression by the Diaz government could not stop them. Finally, the hour came. Revolución, the 30-year-old Diaz dictatorship had to go. Ya yeah, basta. As the revolution deepened, you could hear cries for pan y justicia, tierra y libertad, bread and justice, land and liberty. Grito Emiliano Zapata, quiero tierra y libertad. heroes of that revolution are close to Chicano hearts. We remember General Emiliano Zapata fighting in the south with thousands of peasants at his side. We remember General Pancho Villa in the north. The best U.S. generals couldn't catch him. We remember the women who disguised themselves as men and fought with arms. Some reached high rank, like General Carmen Robles, shown here with her staff. Valentina, Valentina, rendido estoy a tus pies. Si me han de matar, Mañana que me maten de una vez. We remember the thousands of women with names like Valentina and Adelita who worked alongside the troops as cooks, nurses, messengers, soldaderas of many different skills. We remember the children who also fought in this long struggle. And we remember Mexicanos living in the United States who supported the revolution, like the brothers Enrique and Ricardo Flores Magón. 
They had been exiled from Mexico. Ricardo organized workers in this country and edited an influential newspaper called Regeneración. The revolution won land for some of the peasants, at least for a while. It was also a time of great suffering. A million civilians died in the struggle. This hardship made many Mexicanos think about moving north to the United States for work. At the time, U.S. industry was growing fast and had an urgent need for labor. So Mexicans were contracted to work in El Norte. By 1920, over 400,000 had come north. Raza worked as far east as Pennsylvania in the steel mills and as far west as the farms of the Yakima Valley in Washington State. Raza worked in the slaughterhouses of Chicago. Raza worked on the railroads all over the West. Above all, Raza worked in the fields, in Los Files. Nobody should ever forget that the food you eat comes from those fields. Chances are that any fruit or vegetable you eat has been grown by a Mexican. Mexicanos have done this work under terrible conditions. They had to use tools like the cortijo, the short-handled hoe, which kept you bent over all day long. Up to California, from Mexico you come, to the Sacramento Valley, to toil in the sun. Your wife and seven children, they're working every Along with Chinese, Filipino, and other workers brought here, Mexicanos built the wealth of the Southwest. It was their labor that made the owners rich. Some of those owners testified before Congress in the 1920s that Mexican labor was vital to the development of agriculture and industry valued at $5 billion. But still they thought two cents an hour was a good enough wage for Mexicans and Chicanos. You fought for union wages and your fight has just begun. You're a proud man. Casa workers began to revolt against their miserable wages and working conditions. Cries of huelga, strike, began to sweep the West from Arizona to Idaho, Michigan to California. Thousands of workers walked off the job, refusing to work. Viva la huelga! In 1913, Mexicanos working at the Rockefeller mine in Ludlow, Colorado, went on strike. When the bosses took the workers' housing away, they had to move into tents. One day, Rockefeller had company guards and the state militia open fire on those tents. It was a massacre. Eighteen people, including eight Chicano children, were machine gunned to death. In 1933, the El Monte Berry strike brought together Chicano, Japanese, and Anglo workers demanding higher wages. When refused, they went out on strike. Their protest failed, but it sparked militancy elsewhere. That year, 15,000 cotton workers struck in the San Joaquin Valley of California to protest a pay rate of only 60 cents for every 100 pounds. Growers ambushed workers as they left a meeting, killing several. Then police called it a riot and arrested the workers' leaders. Strikes spread like wildfire in the 1930s. Pecan workers at 130 plants in San Antonio, Texas walked out. They were led by Emma Tenayuca, who was barely 20 years old. The strikers did not stop, even though police attacked them with tear gas. Then came the Depression. The U.S. economy crashed, banks closed, people couldn't find work and went hungry. The bosses wanted somebody to blame for this economic crisis. Our unemployment problem was transferred to the United States from foreign lands. 
And if we had refused admission to the 16,500,000 foreign born in our midst, there would be no serious unemployment problem to harass us. So they scapegoated Mexican immigrants just as they do today. The government put 500,000 so-called aliens on trains to Mexico by force. Many of them had been born in this country. Many were U.S. citizens. During all these years, Mexicanos were depicted as dumb, lazy, criminal, and sneaky. These images of raza serve to keep people's minds chained. These images tell Mexicanos in the U.S. how to see themselves. They tell the rest of the world how to see Mexicanos and Chicanos. So, if it's a Mexican in the old days, the person is romantic and colorful. If it's a Mexican today, you see a wetback or a gangster, whatever the stereotype. Chicanos aren't quite human, right? All this was part of being colonized by the United States. All this is part of the racism Raza has faced in the schools, hospitals, factories, courts, the whole sistema. But we weren't going to accept racism forever. Workers formed unions, communities formed mutual aid societies, professionals formed organizations like LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. The Raza tradition of community resistance continued to grow all through the 1930s. The story of Chicanos and Chicanas that we have just told you hasn't been taught in school to young Raza or anybody else. It is our American history. Students are told that American history is the Pilgrims and the Mayflower and George Washington. But what about the Native Americans whose land was stolen? What about the Mexicans who were robbed and treated like a colony? What about the enslaved Africans? What about the Chinese, the Filipinos, and other Asian and Pacific Islanders who all built this country? What about the millions of Anglo workers who have enriched men with names like Vanderbilt and Rockefeller? Today, Rasa say, we demand that these other histories be recognized and taught. We demand to learn them. Thousands of junior high and high school students, as well as college students, have been making that demand. When youth, any youth, are not taught those histories, they are cheated out of a full education. They are all underprivileged. Visions of my ancestors and then what the people do. Visions of a culture which should not be contested. Hey yo. But then it regressed into where we are now. Where we're going with the plan. Tell me who we In part two of the story, we'll look at what happened to Chicanos in World War II, the Zoot Suit riots, and new struggles. We'll look at the Movimiento years when Chicanos insisted on decolonizing their minds and their raza homeland. Decolonize and viva la raza! We shed blood and die for what we do not own. Now if you take a look around, hand they manifest destiny. It may you got the rest, but they can't get the best of me. Cause I feel the pain of past generations. Feeling that pain, letting hard destinations take course. As I cut a path to the soul and each to the goal.